you know, Brother Scott, however I sit down for a minute and start praying and thinking, and even if I'm a little bit tired, when you're done, I'm, I'm ready to go. So, appreciate it. Yeah. Welcome, folks. Uh, we'll continue the uh, sermon series on compelling lives. Today we're going to talk about um, the role of the scriptures in our lives. And it might be a little different way of looking at it because I'm going to focus on the way in which the whole story of the scriptures are meant to shape us. In other words, that the scriptures aren't there for us to sort of just pick and choose and use and quote to each other, but the whole story of salvation, as it's recorded in the scriptures, is there to shape us and help us be the folks Jesus needs us to be. I um, want to uh, welcome folks who are joining us online, and uh, I've kind of skipped, and maybe the wave right now is a good thing while we're thinking of it, because I'll forget in a minute if we don't. We're glad folks are joining us online, and uh, church school following service will go ahead about 10 minutes after service and step up the steps to the uh, fireside room for some conversation, and I'll bring, I know it's an antiquated thing now, I've got this huge Bible, it's the Bible in 26 translations. But even now, it's sort of, you know, outdated in terms of everything you can find on your phone, you know, the, you could get the Bible in 326 <laughs> translations, but it's, it's a place to start anyway in our study and conversation. Um, Mary and Tom Westgate, um, are providing refreshments, so we are. Gr Tom is pointing to Mary, and I, I won't dispute your internal understanding there as a family. So we appreciate it, and we'll enjoy that. The women's Bible study is on right to, uh, tomorrow at one. Ruth yeah. or Roberta, one of you. Okay, I knew you were kind of both. Uh, doing that, 1 o'clock. Worship team Tuesday at 5 p.m. We're working on uh, some scriptures for August, and uh, we've sort of got a theme started, and it's, uh, we're just wrestling down some ideas for some scripture study in August. I will share with you a couple of updates about our um, food pantry ministry, you know, um, help in that regard. The mobile food pantry, the truck that came in last Thursday, appreciate folks who came out and helped with that. On Thursday afternoon at the Action Ministry parking lot, 131 households were served. Uh, that's 366 people. Uh, 111 seniors of the people, 98 children and 17 veterans. Um, so a busy afternoon over on Michigan and, um, well, actually Main Street, but around Michigan. Um, some folks lined up. And then yesterday, the Saturday morning food pantry at Action Ministries where folks come in between 10 and 12, 70 families were served. Am I, I got that right, Sharon? Okay, and that is, I don't know how many people, but it's, you know, up over 200, I imagine, people were served just yesterday morning. So that's a pretty big morning of need and opportunity to help folks in need. So I am going to turn things over right now to Nancy as she leads us into the worship. Good morning. Um, please stand me and join me in the call to worship. We will be reading this responsively. We come for God gathers us here. We come for God welcomes us here. We come, for God reunites us here. Where the wicked risen model justice, where the sick are praying in the last peace. Please 
Please remain, remain standing for the opening hymn, which was written by Charles Wesley in 1739. He wrote it to commemorate the first anniversary of his con conversion. In his lifetime, he wrote over 6,000 hymns, and he lived to be 81 years old and wrote a hymn every year at least to celebrate his birthday. So as you're having your birthdays, think about that, and maybe you'd like to write a hymn for your each birthday. Um, he wrote it to, he was thinking of his mentor who was a missionary and said if he had a thousand tongues, he would use them to praise God. So our first hymn is, O oh, For a Thousand Tongues to Sing. It's number 57 in your hymnal, and we'll be singing verses one through four. <laughs> for three things. We'll be reading this in unison. Thanks be to you, our Lord Jesus, for all the benefits you have given us and for all the pains and insults you have borne for us. O oh, most merciful Redeemer, friend and brother, of you three things we pray to see you more clearly, love you more dearly, follow you more nearly, day by day. Amen. Our first reading is Genesis 1, verses 26 through 27. Then God said, let us make humans in our image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humans in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Our second reading is Hebrews 2, verses 6 through 9. But someone has testified somewhere what are humans that you are mindful of them, or mortals that you care for them? You have made them for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honor, subjecting all things under their feet. Now, in subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to them, but we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by, grace, by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Please stand for the reading of the gospel, Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory, as the angels will be gathered before him, 
and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates his sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to the least of one the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, you who are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to the one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Please be seated. Let us pray. Holy Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts assembled be acceptable unto you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I imagine that all of our lives share some things in common, like every week brings a little bit of sunshine and a little bit of rain and a little bit of encouragement and some things that bother us. And I'm no different. And so um, I, this past week, had many wonderful interchanges and engagements and things and conversations with folks around town and beyond. But I did have one uh, rather discouraging thing happen, and I'm going to share that with you, not just because I'm going negative, but it discouraged me, and maybe together we can work on that. I went to the post office, and I often see folks at the post office, right? It's kind of a nice place to bump into people and say good morning or hello or catch up on things. If you haven't seen someone in a while, uh, some of us see each other there, seem to be on the same schedule of dropping by and picking up and dropping off and all of that sort of thing. But uh, one day last week, I walked into the post office. It wasn't very busy, but I walked in and walked past. Uh, if you've been in our local post office, there's a kind of counter table in the outer lobby where the mailboxes are. And I call it a sorting table. <laughs> you know, sometimes folks go to the mailbox and they'll get something and sort through their mail. And, you know, if something is of interest to them, they'll use the circular file there and take the other stuff home and all of that. So um, I walked by that and I saw a color glossy, somewhat at least professionally printed flyer sitting on top 
of that table, nothing else there. And uh, I thought, huh, interesting. And um, I turned and I saw that there was some scripture. I thought, huh. So I've always got my nose up for scripture, right? You know, if I see it, I'm curious and interested. And then as I looked at it, <clears throat> what became apparent to me, I'm going to be a little vague here. What became apparent to me is that it was a flyer attacking a group of people. And it was, it used the pho photography in a way to portray some group of people that were seen, are seen as a threat to our society. And uh, I don't remember the exact words, but it was basically of that nature, you know, watch out, look out for these people, so to speak. And um, I had to compose myself for a minute, think, gosh, what do I do here? Um, pretend it's not there, walk by, because I'm not presuming anybody connected with the post office put it there. I trusted they did not, and they didn't. And uh, do I do something that maybe is a little bit devious and just add it to the round file there where folks sort their mail? I almost did that, to be honest. And I said, no, I'm going to chat with the, the officials. Maybe they don't know something like that is there. So I picked it up, and I walked to the counter, and uh, the postal officials are very kind, very understanding. And I, you know, I knew not to be a crab to hardworking people at the federal postal facility who might not know what was going on. So I said, uh, excuse me, uh, have you seen this before? And the person behind the counter kind of in exasperation really said, oh, there's another one. I said, oh. And the postmaster came out, we, who was very polite, and um, they said, I don't know who is leaving those. And I said, well, this is federal facility. Is that? They said, absolutely not. You know, people aren't supposed to do that. And um, the one of the people said, you know, it even things like yard sale flyers and so forth, you know, innocent things. We just can't really do that here. And so I said, well, here, I'd like to turn this in to you. And, and they said, well, somebody who's doing that also are putting these out on cars and parking lots. So I said something I, that I think was said in a gentle way, but I said, you know, as a, as a citizen, I really find this objectionable. And um, I understand your, your position, and it's tough, you know. But just so you hear from another citizen that isn't at all happy about this sort of thing. So then I went home, and my conscience started to bother me. Not because I said something, but because of the approach that I took. Because what really bothered me, and I won't speak for others, but for myself, what really bothered me is the way the scriptures um, were hijacked and used entirely for judgment on a group of people and used, in essence, as a weapon of attack. And I don't know that anybody in the post office knew I was your pastor, and I'm happy to share that, but I don't think that gives me any more or less credibility in the community. Uh, but later in the day, I did need to mail another piece, and I said, I need to go just be honest about what's on my heart. And so I went in and conducted business. This is later the same day, and the uh, person behind the counter uh, was a kind person, had helped me many times over the last several months. And I said, you know, I hope I didn't, you know, sound like just another crabby citizen complaining about some other citizen, <laughs> you know. We've got a lot of that. And she said, no, I, I didn't, didn't take it that way. This has been frustrating for us. And I said, um, 
But really, I said I came to confess because I don't think I was completely honest with you earlier. It kind of got her curiosity up, right? Um, and I said, you know, there's scripture quoted on this flyer that is an attack flyer. I said, and I'm a Christian. And she said, and you take the Bible seriously too, right? I said, yes, I do. Yes, I do. I didn't tell her I was a pastor. I think that's immaterial, really. But as a follower of Christ, and then I said, well, I may be talking to you in a way that I shouldn't on your work time in the federal facility, but I want to, I said, but as a follower of Christ, um, this is just not at all an appropriate way to engage the scriptures. That's my position. That's where I'm coming from. And it was a very pleasant conversation, but, you know, I had to go back and own it as a Christian. As a Christian. Okay? Not just as a citizen or somebody who doesn't like to see Bible verses. <laughs> But as a Christian, as somebody who loves the Holy Scriptures, as life-giving, we're going to sing later wonderful words of life. I mean that. But to have it used in our community to attack people. And sadly, that's where we are in our society as a whole in a lot of instances. And it's not just an isolated situation. So I won't go down the negative road anymore because I know that we want to focus our energies from the gospel in a more positive way, but it is happening a lot more than a lot of folks recognize. And someone will say something to me like, boy, somebody said something to me the other day that has really troubled me. And, and Things are shared with me almost as if these must be isolated instances. They're not. <laughs> They're not. And that's troubling. And I need to be honest. It's not because I'm a secularist. It's not because I, you know, follow some off-the-wall philosophy of life that that offends me. It's as a follower of Jesus Christ that offends me. Okay? I'm just going to own it. And then, of course, I invited folks to service, you know, which may have been a little bold in the post office, but, I'm, you know, I'm going to do that, okay? I'm just telling you, your pastor's going to do that. So, anyway, but um, that was that experience. So, what do we do? What do we do when the world thinks that either you quote the Bible and you're mean-spirited and judgmental or you're, you know, don't like the Bible, you don't want to engage it, or you, you know, are some secularist, whatever that means. What do we do? And I like to lean in <laughs> in, an, in an honest and loving way. I'm happy to lean in. Tell you the truth, the scripture, I saw the book of the scripture, which is one of my favorite books as far as the history of, of redemption in Israel, and, and that's probably why it caught my eye to begin with. Now, it was not used in that way, but what do we do? Whew, I've asked Nancy to read uh, scripture from Genesis from Hebrews, and from Matthew. Now, these are, of course, first book of the Bible, Old Testament. Hebrews was a document, a letter written uh, following the time of Jesus. It's tough to know exactly who Hebrews is meant for. Most scholars will say that it is for second-generation Christians who have lost a little bit of the fire, you know, the, the miracle of everything that went on when Jesus was on earth had happened just long enough ago that they had to reevaluate, you know, where were their hearts here? And so there's a lot of talk in Hebrews about the sacrifice of Christ. I've emphasized that in earlier weeks. 
and the way in which Christ is the ultimate sacrifice. We don't earn our way, but Jesus, through his life, death, and resurrection, Jesus has redeemed us. And then Matthew 25, which is a scripture about judgment. <laughs> Scriptures don't shy away from judgment. I don't shy away from judgment because it's impolite. I just read a Bible where my Lord tells me that how I treat other people says a lot about how I love or don't love Him. You with me? It's in the book. There's a lot of stuff in the book, and it's tough to wrestle through sometimes, but it's all there. I can't be a, f a disciple of Jesus Christ and hate folks. I just can't. I can't do that. And I want to say something with a little bit of dark humor here, but I'm not sure it'll, how it will go over. There are times I want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ and hate somebody, you know? And the only reason I said that is because I know I'm not the only person in the room who has that going on in here from time to time. Oh, come on now. Yeah, you're not fooling me. <laughs> I'm not fooling me. But I can't do it. I can't do it, man. <laughs> And I'm glad, right? I'm glad. Jesus wants me to be somebody else. Not somebody else other than me, but the real me. The real me. You look in Genesis 1, 26, this is, and 27. This is beautiful stuff about the creation. This is near the end of the first creation story as it's told, let's say. It's told again in, in uh, Genesis 2 in a little different way. But in chapter 1, You've got all of the creation, and it was good. You know, humanity hadn't goofed it up yet, but, you know, it was good. And then man and woman are created. And the language here is so powerful. Created in the image of God. You know, the closest thing to God walking around in the world are the human beings we bump into every day. That's not some new age philosophy. I don't worship people like I worship God. But the closest thing, the hint, the sign, the pointer, you know, human beings. Now let me say something about this. The focus here in Genesis 1 is on human beings, not human behavior. Every human being is created in the image of God. That doesn't mean every human being behaves in a godly way, <laughs> right? We know that in our own lives, and we see it around us. I'm not making a claim about who I agree with or disagree with in terms of cultural values or lifestyle when I'm offended by that flyer in the post office. We can agree or disagree about certain things people do. But Jesus won't let me attack people. Yeah, it's, that's not in the book. I've looked. No, I haven't really looked that hard, but I'm being a little bit of a wise guy. But it's not there. It's just not there. We're created in the image. I mean, all people. And then we're to grow into the likeness. Some uh, Christian traditions really go to town on those two words, image and likeness. They might be stretching it a bit, but they say we're all created in the image. That's our being of, of infinite value. But how we act and behave, that's the likeness of God. Are we, are we God-like or Christ-like, we might say? Okay? One is seen as just the created value of people. The other is seen as the growth in becoming like Christ in our loving behavior. Okay? Now, Hebrews 2, 6 through 9, Nancy read this. This takes it from a little different angle. You see? 
Because Hebrews 2, 6 through 9 says, Jesus Christ tasted death for every one. Two words there, by the way, every and one. Every one. Each and every human being. This has been a Methodist teaching on the, the salvation or the atonement of Christ since the beginning. Uh, there have been strengths and weaknesses to that. It's not as if our tradition believes that every, oh yeah, Jesus loves everybody, blah, 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 in a sort of superficial, general way. No, no. Jesus loves every one in a personal, intense way. You with me? I don't know how he does it, but he does it, right? And that is what we would call redeemed value. That's the gospel message that comes to us after the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. There's a created value created in the image of God, and then a redeemed value. Okay? And grace is the way in which Christ loves no matter what. And you know what? When you feel discouraged that you can't love that way, I mean, we all do. It's grace that helps us love that way. You with me? You say, man, this guy's been preaching the scriptures. He hasn't talked about Laura Haviland. Well, Number one, the scriptures are more important. <laughs> Number two, the life of this woman, Laura Haviland, is not told just as a nice history lesson, but as a way for us to get inside somebody who understood the scriptures. With me? This woman, Laura Haviland, and you see where these themes play out. She was born in Canada. Um, you know, the Canadian, -Ameri now American border, moved to New York State, was raised in a Quaker family. And interesting teaching among others, among Quakers, has been an emphasis on the sacredness of every person. So this idea of created value, no matter what, very strong in Laura Haviland's life. Now, I mean no disrespect to her Quaker tradition, but a lot of folks don't realize later she became what was called a Wesleyan Methodist because she wanted to know her value, really, not only as a created being, but as a redeemed and saved being. And she found that the Methodist church meeting that was preaching and talking about that was, really spoke to her heart. So she got inside these two ideas I've just mentioned from Scripture, created value of everybody and redeemed value. And you know, she called that a fathomless fountain. Interesting. And by that she meant this love of God that just keeps coming up, keeps bubbling up no matter what. Believe me, we've tried to stop it, humanity, right? Come on. Be honest. There are times when we just want to put our hands over that fountain of grace. It seems silly that we do that, but it seems, that's what human beings do sometimes. But it was just always bubbling up, a fathomless fountain. And when they made a st statue of her in Adrian, Michigan, they made a sculpture sitting on top of a public drinking fountain. It's very, uh, it's, I, it sounds kind of odd, but it was put up by the Women's Christian Temperance Union in 1909, the WCTU. Anybody ever heard of the WCTU? You might say, oh yeah, my mother was a member, or my aunt was a member, or whatever. Women's, it was uh, an organization of Christian people, mostly women, dedicated to <clears throat> challenge, you know, overcoming alcohol abuse. And so the thing in the WCTU that became sort of a trademark is to have community drinking fountains. 
It had a symbolic value, pure drinking water as opposed to, you know, the dangers of alcoholism. And we're talking about an era in the 19th century when a lot of public drinking water was not particularly uh, clean or safe, right? So it was both a kind of health crusade, if you will, but also a message of purity and life through public drinking water. So big stone or granite, you know, fountains would be erected by the WCTU. L Laura Havilland was a member, and she is actually portrayed in, in sculpture on this big drinking fountain in Adrian, Michigan. And so, you know, it's a typical WCTU story because she is there as one representing clean and healthy water in the face of alcohol abuse, but the scripture on the fountain is from Matthew 25. Nancy read it, and the one that, it's not the whole scripture Nancy read, but there's a short passage on the fountain from Matthew 25. And at this drinking water from the Women's Christian Temperance Union is a scripture that says, I was thirsty and you gave me drink. Not just pure water, not just anti-alcohol, as important as that consciousness was and is, but an emphasis on serving others. This woman, Laura Havilland, was a conductor on the Underground Railroad. She served a lot of people who came through and stayed overnight at her farm in Lenawee County, Michigan. She was a missionary. She went south during the Civil War when the Union Army would sort of take control of a region and she would organize relief efforts for hungry people and sick people in war-torn areas. And yet, she understood the fathomless fountain of grace, see? as moving her to serve others. Now, I'll close this moment around Laura Havilland with a quote. You see, when she was working on the Underground Railroad, she went to visit people in prison. Kind of sounds like Matthew 25 right there, doesn't it? She went to visit people in prison who were held because they were helping on the Underground Railroad. In other words, it was illegal to help people escape slavery, and many people were put in prison. She went and visited one man named Calvin Fairbank in Louisville, Kentucky, and she got into a conversation with the jailer, and this jailer tried to convince her that slavery wasn't that bad. And tried to convince her that abolitionists, people who worked against slavery, that they had a, a secular agenda. They were using some foreign philosophy, modern philosophy. They weren't really relying on scripture, okay? And so this Louisville jailer, uh, Colonel Buckner, said, quote, I would like to know, Mrs. Haviland, where you abolitioners get your principles of equal rights. I'd like to know where you find them. So Laura Haviland, who is probably about five foot tall, looked this guy in the eyes and said, quote, we find them between the lids of the Bible. God created man in his own image, in his own likeness. From a single pair sprang all the inhabitants of the whole earth. God created of one blood all the nations that dwell upon the earth. That's a reference to a passage in Acts uh, chapter 17. And when the Savior left his abode with the Father to dwell a season upon our earthly ball, to suffer and die the ignominious death of the cross... He shed his precious blood for the whole human family, irrespective of nation or color.
We believe all are alike objects of redeeming love. We believe our Heavenly Father gave the power of choice to beings he created for his own glory, and this power to choose or refuse good or evil is a truth coexistent with humanity's creation. This, at least, is my firm conviction. Whew. It so happens this guy Buckner was a Methodist. And I detect in there a rebuke because the Methodist teaching was that Jesus died for all. He was a class meeting leader, meaning he was a supposedly respected person in town who led Bible meetings. And the only words I did not find in actual print are, and you call yourself a Methodist class leader, right? <laughs> oh, golly. The Bible is not there to be used as a weapon, to be wielded and, and judge, you know, used simply to judge other people. That's God's business. I'm not saying there's no judgment. You read in Matthew 25, there's judgment there. It's just not the kind of judgment mean-spirited folks think judgment is about. I'm sorry. David Buttrick told the story um, several years ago. He was a, a wonderful Christian guy and preacher, and he liked to vacation in Michigan, so he would spend time up north on the lakes and rivers and stuff. And he got to know some of the people in the local church where he lived. And there was a woman who was known for the way in which she'd just find unique ways to love people. Um, some of the things you folks do all the time, you know, giving folks rides to the hospital, helping folks who need transport here and there, um, some food, picking up groceries, sitting with someone when they're sick, right? And she never quoted a political party or a political candidate. She never, you know, did any of that. And she knew her Bible inside and out. And to be honest, folks thought she was a little bit strange. She did all that. And when she died, her funeral was held in the church. And Buttrick says that after the sermon, there was a time, we call it the time of witness, where folks can come up and say a few words about somebody's life. And the first person got up and said some things and then said, um, she was um, different. And then uh, another person got up and uh, after a few minutes said, uh, well, just like Joe said, she was, she was different. And then the preacher evidently said, you know, anyone else have a word to say? And there was a hand that went up in the back of the sanctuary and a timid person kind of walked up front and everybody waited. And... Uh, got up to the microphone and looked out at everybody and said, I don't think she was afraid to be a Christian. So how do you read the Bible? And if you'll pardon me referencing this day, what are they going to say? when they're talking about you on that send-off. What are they going to say? Amen. Please stand for the hymn of response, Wonderful Words of Life, number 600 in your hymnal. We'll be singing all three verses.
seated. It's not in your bulletin, and I didn't tell folks I'd walk away from the microphone. I'm sorry about that. Are we okay? Okay. There he goes again, just moving around. Um, we have some things on the altar that I hope you notice. Thanks, Kathy, for coming up. Now, I noticed, too, that we had, Kathy reminded me of this, several folks brought in some flowers today. And I just want to say thank you. Uh, Kathy brought these. And Scott brought these, though I know Naomi has a ministry where she really tends flowers. And, and then we've got, now my eyes, you got to give me a little break here. Looks like sunflowers back there. Those are from, I'm going to say Gloria, but is that right? Barb. It's from Barb, okay. There are some daisies and hydrangeas. Okay, wow. So it's, I just thought that was nice. Now, we're here to do something very important and I'll explain it to you. It's a little different than we've done before. Um, this quilt, Kathy made, and, oh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna make sure everybody's got a look there. I'll do the thing here. Um, and then, uh, you, I don't know if there's a special name for the backside or if it's a liner kind of thing. I, I, I don't, Okay, I don't want to mess up my quilt terminology. But Kathy uh, and some other folks have made quilts too, wonderful ones. They make these, and we um, usually pray over them with them being held for somebody who really needs a lift. And uh, some of you may have received a quilt in the past. I know my father received one, and that meant a lot to him when he was in his, you know, final kind of days on earth. Not, he had it for a little longer than that, which was nice, but um, very comforting. <clears throat> this quilt will be given to the United Methodist District Superintendent, Dwayne Bagley, whose office is in Kalamazoo, and uh, Dwayne is one of the pastors in Michigan who is asked to sort of keep a watch over about 100 churches or so. And he's, you know, the district superintendent. The district superintendents, I need to say this, it's not necessarily a, an advancement or a career move to be a district superintendent. People are not ordained to be district superintendents. Um, they are like any other pastor, and they are asked by our bishop to sort of take on that role for usually six years, though I believe Dwayne has been pressed into service for an extra year or two. <laughs> and um, it's been a hard go because of the disagreements and controversies in the United Methodist Church. And every year... I don't think I'm sharing anything out of school. Every year, Pastor Duane writes a letter to the pastors on our district, we'd say. And um, it just sounded like he was really down. <laughs> and, you know, how hard he's tried to help folks live the gospel together, and yet how tough it's been because of um, the conflict in the denomination and some other things. He wasn't whining. He wasn't complaining. He's, I think he was basically saying, if you feel tired sometime, I get it, you know? And um, so I'm asking us to pray for Pastor Duane, not, and I want to be really clear about this, not because you agree with everything in the United Methodist Church today, not because we're backing the DSs as some kind of church political move. I don't care about that. 
Uh, not because Pastor Duane needs us to agree with him all the time, but this congregation excels in loving others. Sometimes when there ain't a lot of loving going on. And so I'm going to ask us to pray for Duane, and then when I go see him in a few weeks for a meeting, I'll take him this gift from the Dwajak people. And I got to tell you, district superintendents get a lot of things sent to them, told to them, phone calls, letters, hopefully nothing too nefarious. But district superintendents don't get a lot of this. So you can be a part of an exciting living of the gospel. Fair enough? I'm going to go get the prayer, Kathy, and I took extra time, but thanks. I'll step down here. Excuse me for having been up there. Let's pray. Almighty God, we pray that Duane may be affirmed during these challenging times. When he is exhausted, renew his soul. When he feels down, lift him up. When he experiences the anger and unkind behavior of others, grant him poise and purpose. When he needs a break, Lord, offer him respite. When he desires support, move others to his side. Everlasting and almighty God, show forth your power that by your grace, Brother Duane may find himself upheld by your strength and encouraged by your love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thanks, Kathy. And thank you, folks. I do have copies of the prayer if somebody would like the prayer following service. I have to get my right notes together here. I feel as if the prayer list is a little bit short today, and I may miss some folks, so I apologize for that. But I do want to mention just some families that we are continuing to keep in our hearts. Uh, the Chris Miller family, Floyd and Cheryl Groner and their family. The Judd and Kripe families. I ask us to continue to pray for Mike and Betty Knapp. And to continue praying for the Merle Bromley family. I'm personally grateful for the way some folks took the address for um, Merle's daughter and able to share a word. Um, we've gotten word recently that Fran Skibby's having another tough time. And uh, Fran is going through a series of some tests. Of course, a lot of it is related to the back pain from, you know, very serious illness there. Uh, but also some other infusions that she has needed and so forth. So let's keep Fran and Frank in our prayers. And then uh, I've got two really nice or, uh, pieces of good news. You ready for some good news? Sure. Come on. I've got two here. One that Liz and I will share that um, our middle daughter, we have four children together, but the daughter who is the middle daughter and her husband, Phil, are expecting a baby. So, thanks. So we slipped out of town yesterday and went to Chicago and spent the day with them and so forth. And so. Oh, yeah, February of 24 is the due date. So, yeah, and this will be the first grandchild. So there's a good one. And then we've got another one that's some, some kind of good news here. 
Uh, Donna Pripichletti has, and Donna, I've got to get my eyes working here. Oh, I, you have six great nephews now. That's the total number of little tykes. Okay, gotcha. Donna has six great nephews. <clears throat> however, on July 14th, not however, but get this. <laughs> July 14th, Vanessa Pripet Phillips and her husband Rylan welcomed identical twin boys. George Thomas and Arthur Johnston. So you got doubly blessed very recently. So that's good news. There's always something to be thankful for. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we come with burdens on our hearts, with struggles. We are very much aware, Lord, of the ways in which our lives need you and how others need you. Guide us that we may be the folks you need us to be when others hurt, when others have lost loved ones, when we have lost loved ones, when others hunger, when others thirst, when others are treated unfairly, Lord. And Lord, keep in our hearts an awareness of your many blessings, including the blessings of new life. We ask this in the name of our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, and we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from you. For thine is the kingdom, and the glory forever. Now is the time to return some of what we have been given. The music played during the offertory is All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. The ushers will bring the offering forward during the doxology. Please stand for the doxology, praise God from whom all blessings flow, number 95.
offer our gifts to you, Lord, with grateful, cheerful hearts. Thank you that you meet our needs on the journey, providing what we need when we need it. Trusting you, we can share what we have with others. And we do this joyfully together today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please remain standing for our closing hymn, The Summons, number 2130 in the Faith We Sing book. We'll be singing all five verses. Go now in the knowledge and love of God, the Creator Almighty, and the grace of our crucified and risen Lord Jesus, and in the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.